Welcome to another episode of Dank Times, Danker Thoughts with me, Angelo. I have my co-host here with me today, LaFonda. And she is trying to say hey, hey to her fans. Yeah, okay, well, you got to simmer down, girl. Oh, my goodness. All right, you want to get on my lap as I talk about Joe Biden and my fantasy football and what happened in Chile and a bunch of other things? Yeah. I don't know if you guys can pick that shit up or not. But anyway, what's been going on? I hope you all had a good Labor Day. I had some family from out of town, Colorado to be specific. And I spent all Labor Day with them. I hosted them at my house. My aunt and uncle and their friend took them out to downtown Kent to a very nice restaurant there called Wild Wheat. Had myself a dank vanilla latte and a real sexy smoked salmon omelet. Oh, I can still taste the cream cheese and the chives and the green onions. Ooh, yummy. And it was a, it was a really good, relaxing couple days. Uh, I saw my father on Sunday, which was normal Saturday. What the hell did I do Saturday? I don't think I did much on Saturday except, boy, did I power through the Game of Thrones TV show and House of Dragon, which I'll get into later in this episode, but uh, your boy's excited. <laughs> Not much is new on the lady front since uh, a couple episodes ago. There's been some drama with some of the ladies. Uh, not of my doing, just, you know, life, family, relationship, shit happens, you know. So, you know, it is what it is. You gotta roll with the punches, uh, you know, roll with whatever life throws at you, as the saying goes. Oh, I'm glad you agree, LaFonda. So, yeah, I hope y'all had a good Labor Day. So let's uh, dig in and talk about... Uh, let, me, let me knock out my fantasy football stuff here. So a couple episodes ago, I brought up that I had my first fantasy football draft, and that was done in Idaho with my boys back in... Eh, you know, whenever I went to Idaho, I forget. I think about a month ago. Uh, but I am in two other leagues, three leagues in total, because I'm a sadist, and I want to... Uh, I want fantasy football to ruin the joy that I get from actually watching football. <laughs> but that was an ESPN draft, the one in Idaho. And the two other fantasy football drafts I am doing are both on Yahoo, which I think overall is a better layout. They have better data, better uh, analytical data. You are graded by your draft, which is always um, good uh, bulletin board uh, shit-talking material. But let me just go through his really quickly. It was a 20-round draft, two-quarterback league. And let me tell you, from the beginning to end, my first pick was Justin Jefferson, the wide receiver from Minnesota. DeAndre Swift, running back from Detroit. I picked him in the uh, previous draft. Debo Samuel, wide receiver from San Francisco. Ezekiel Elliott, that gremlin motherfucker, running back from Dallas. Brees Hall, running back from the New York Jets. He's a rookie. Dalton Schultz is my tight end from Dallas. Same guy I have in my other league. Jalen Waddell, wide receiver from Miami. Miles Saunders, running back from Philadelphia. Rashad Bateman, wide receiver from Baltimore. And I finally took a quarterback with my 10th pick, and I was the last manager on the board to address the quarterback situation. And if I do shitty in this league, it's probably going to be because I put off selecting a quarterback until the middle of the round, which is, uh, again, this is a two-quarterback league. So my first quarterback I drafted at number 10 was Tua Tagovailoa from uh, Miami. I know I butchered his last name there. Sorry, Tua. And by the way, I named my team just the two of us. <laughs> uh, and then Cole Kemet, Kemet, tight end from Chicago, you know, back up to Schultz. Uh, I took my second quarterback, Justin Fields. 
the uh, Chicago Bears quarterback. Then James Robinson, the running back from Jacksonville. Chase Claypool, wide receiver from Pittsburgh. I have him in my other draft. My third quarterback to be on my bench is Baker Mayfield, the new quarterback in Carolina. My team defense is the Green Bay Packers. And what's different in this league is that we play a team defense, but then we also have three defensive players. And usually you get linebackers and safeties because they're the ones that uh, wrap up, rack up the tackles and sacks. And so I got uh, the middle linebacker of the Seattle Seahawks, Jordan Brooks, the linebacker for the New York Jets, C.J. Mosley, the linebacker from Minnesota, Eric Kendricks, and my last pick of the draft was my kicker, Tyler Bass, the Buffalo Bills kicker, who, if uh, all predictions are accurate, the Buffalo Bills are going to have one of the top offenses in football, which means they should, hypothetically, then have one of the best-performing kickers with the extra points, the red zone kicks. That should be a piece of cake. So, uh, yeah, all in all, I think both my teams are pretty good, the ESPN and my one Yahoo League. However, if I get my shit punched in on this one, obviously I'm going to blame the lack of good quarterbacks. I have Tua Tagalaivoa and Justin Fields. Both of them really haven't proven that they belong as starters in the pros, but they're both young, high draft picks. So this could be their last year before they are seen as possible busts. And of course, Baker Mayfield, being my backup quarterback to both, he's changing teams. He's coming off a bad year in Cleveland. So there's a lot of questions with my quarterbacks. But I think I am loaded with the running backs and the wide receivers. Tight ends, eh, I think I have two decent ones. Uh, I was debating if I should draft a third, but fuck it, you know what I'm saying? But... Anyway, with that, the personal stuff and the sports stuff done with, let's dig in to the news. A lot is being made of uh, Joe Biden's latest uh, speech. Uh, I think he did that last week. And, of course, it's being called the Dark Brandon speech, which I think is probably the smartest thing the Biden administration has done outside of some of the bills he's passed, which is embrace the stupid right-wing MAGA rhetoric of uh, Brandon what the hell was it suck it Brandon or so I don't know what it was either it's been forever I don't give a fuck o- only idiot Republicans have stupid one-liners like that buzz buzzwords that think uh, drives uh, the other party nuts which in reality 99% of liberal cucks do not care about uh, Brandon or let's go Brandon that's what it is and all that other garbage I you know Trump is the only cocksucking president in my lifetime where his supporters truly are a cult. If you still trust and believe and would vote for President Trump as of, uh, when am I recording, uh, September 6th, 2022, you are a moron. You are, as Biden said, either half a fascist or something. And I know some people are getting pissed by Biden. Oh, he's calling half of the country half fascist, and that's not what he said. I have the transcript here. From that speech. And by the way, if you are truly a Trump supporter right now, then I think Biden, uh, his words should be heard by you. But my uh, point was, is Donald Trump in my lifetime is the only president where his supporters still are uh, happily flying their banners, um, their signs. They have the MAGA bullshit in their house like it's a piece of art. You know, I, I just don't get it because it's supposed to be a pro-American party, right? MAGA is supposed to be a very patriotic, pro-American, nationalistic party. That's what they are. That's what who those people are. And yet they have no problem waving banners, wearing hats, holding up signs from the uh, Trump administration or people who like Trump. And all that shit is made overseas in sweatshops by third world countries like China or Mongolia, fucking, I don't know, the somewhere in the Orient. And you think that would piss off the supporters. Oh, shit, this hat is made in China, but it has Donald Trump's endorsement on it? Well, surely that proves that he is a you know snake oil salesman. He really doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't believe in anything. But no, they still don't give a fuck. So back to the Joe Biden speech, the Dark Brandon speech, which, by the way, I think he, he did look like a supervillain with the lights and the Marines standing behind him. 
But I also think, good, we need a little bit more of that. You can't have those MAGA cucks out here ruining democracy and killing people and storming the Capitol, you know? Those um, jabronis need a good lashing every now and then. But let me go ahead and pull up the transcript here so that people uh, are aware that Biden did not say, half of the country, you're fascist. That's not what he said. So let me go ahead and pull this up here. But first, we must be honest with each other and with ourselves. Too much of what's happening in our country today is not normal. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. And I really can't argue against that. He is calling out specifically Trump and the MAGA Republicans. He's not saying all Republicans. Now, I want to be very clear, very clear up front. Not every Republican, not even the majority of Republicans, are MAGA Republicans. Not every Republican embraces their extreme ideology. I know, because I've been able to work with these mainstream Republicans. And that is a very important part of his speech. He, he, he lays it out right there. Not every Republican, even the majority of Republicans, are MAGA Republicans. And I truly believe that as well. I think if I have a gun to my head, I would say maybe 30% of Republican voters actually are quote-unquote MAGA Republicans. I think a couple of years ago it was maybe 50-50, but after the January 6th Capitol riot and the FBI storming Mar-a-Lago and just more bullshit that comes out of Trump and his uh, supporters' mouths, I think his approval rating has been plummeting. But I digress. Let me, let me go back to the, the uh, transcript here. But there's no question that the Republican Party today is dominated, driven, and intimidated. We'll find a stop by Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. And I could not agree more, Joe, because I agree with him. The mass majority of Republicans are not MAGA Republicans. However, the, the minority, these MAGA cucks, really are dominating, driving, and intimidating all other Republicans. And that's what Biden says, and that's what I believe. I truly believe that. I know a lot of Republicans. Most of them can't stand Trump. A few do, a few. That's why I say they're the minority. And by yeah, they are not the silent majority, by the way. They are the racist, sexist, inbred hick minority of the Republican wing. And the best part is some of them consider themselves pro-life and Christian, which uh, will never cease to uh, dumbfound me. These are hard things, but I'm an American president, not a president of red America or blue America, but of all America. And I believe it's my duty my duty to be level with you, to tell the truth, no matter how difficult, no matter how painful. And here, in my view, is what is true. I mean, this is what's pissing everybody off. MAGA Republicans do not respect the Constitution. I concur, Joe. They do not believe in the rule of law. I concur, Joe. They do not recognize the will of the people. My dick is getting hard, Joe. Keep going. They refuse to accept the results of a free election. Man, my penis, I didn't think it could get even harder, but here it is. And they're working right now, as I speak, in state after state to give power to decide elections in America to partisans and cronies, empowering election deniers to undermine democracy itself. Now, I know you can't see me, but I am pinching my nipples as I read this because everything he just said, brilliantly put, is exactly correct in my estimation and anyone who has common sense, I believe, in this country. MAGA forces are determined to take this country backwards, backwards to an America where there is no right to choose, no right to privacy, no right to contraception, no right to marry who you love. They promote authoritarian leaders, and they fan the flames of political violence that are a threat to our personal rights, to the pursuit of justice, to the rule of law, to the very soul of this country. And I applaud you, Joe, because you needed to say this. You needed to say this months ago. But I'm happy you're riding your positivity wave over these last few weeks and months, really, since uh, the Supreme Court uh, is ruling on uh, Roe v. Wade. But he's absolutely correct. Not every Republican is a MAGA Republican. But these MAGA Republicans are exactly, exactly what this cheat sheet says. I mean, verbatim, that's what they are. They look at the mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th brutally attacking law enforcement, not as insurrectionists who placed a dagger at the throat of our democracy, 
but they look at them as patriots and they see their MAGA failure to stop a peaceful transfer of power as preparation for the 2022 and 2024 elections. Now that I think is a little bit uh, baiting there. It's a little bit of misleading. I don't know if all MAGAs are preparing that, but to say that none of them are, well, that's just an outright lie. They tried everything last time to nullify the votes of 81 million people. This time, they're determined to succeed in thwarting the will of the people. That's why respected conservatives like Federal Circuit Court Judge Michael Ludig has called Trump and the extreme MAGA Republicans a clear and present danger to our democracy. But while the threat to America's democracy is real, I want to say as clearly as we can, we are not powerless in the face of these threats. We are not bystanders in this ongoing attack on democracy. There are far more Americans, far more Americans from every background and belief who reject the extreme MAGA ideology than those that accept it. And folks, it's within our power, it's in our hands, yours and mine, to stop the assault on American democracy. And he's not wrong. Again, um, I wish that they play us on Fox News. They probably won't. And they probably are cutting out certain pits and making him sound like he said something he didn't. But... In my estimation, he's completely accurate in these assessments. MAGA Republicans have made their choice. They embrace anger. They thrive on chaos. They live not in the light of truth, but in the shadow of lies. But together, together, we can choose a different path. We can choose a better path forward to the future, a future of possibility, a future to build a dream and hope, and we're on that path moving forward. And again, I can't really fault him in anything he's saying on this. Because those MAGA voters and those MAGA politicians in Congress truly frighten me and scare me if they are still regurgitating lies, hateful lies, misogyny, sexism, racism, you name it. And if you're getting butthurt by the president talking like this, you may want to check yourself in the mirror, okay? Look at what you truly believe in and then challenge yourself. Be your own devil's advocate to your own beliefs. And if you can't push back on your beliefs, I don't think you truly believe in anything that you believe in then. If, if you're able to push back and see both sides and still come out the other side having your same belief, well, then you at least tried and you came out the other end believing what you believe in. And I can at least respect that. I may not respect what you're saying, but at least I can respect the process you went through to challenge yourself. But uh, yes, Dark Biden here is absolutely right. <laughs> Sith Biden, whatever you want to call him. He's absolutely right. I dug the villainous atmosphere. I dug the Marines behind him. I, can't, I don't know why certain Democrats or liberals are asking him to apologize for things. He flat out said, the president said, not every Republican is a MAGA Republican. Far from it. In fact, he said the majority of Republicans are not MAGA Republicans. So again, he's calling a small minority basically half fascist, which half fascist, it's kind of difficult uh, to understand, to swallow, because how can you be half a fascist? You hate the Jews, but you like their cooking. I mean, I don't know what, I don't know what the difference is. You're either a fascist or not a fascist, in my estimation. If you believe in a few fascist ideologies and you reject certain other ones, you, but you still agree with certain fascist ideologies, to me, that still makes you a fascist. Not half a fascist, not a quarter fascist. A fascist is a fascist, you know? And I'm a proud Antifa in that. By the way, most Americans are Antifa, whether you're blue, whether you're red, whether you're green, who gives a fuck? Antifa, anti-fascist. If you're against fascism, you're automatically Antifa. If you don't like that terminology, well, then use anarchists. The people during the protests who would rather throw bricks at people, bust up windows, beat people up, burn businesses to the ground, that is not Antifa. Those are not pro peaceful protesters, obviously. They are anarchists, and they deserve to get beat up and locked away for a little bit. But uh, with that, we're going to leave U.S. politics for a second. We're going to return, and we're going to talk about what the fuck is happening in Chile with their new leftist president, Boric, which I covered a couple months ago. They have been preparing for a new constitution vote. This, this is huge. You don't see many countries say our existing constitution is out of date or it's you know just wrong. 
it's out of touch. We need to do a new one. We need to write a new one and we have to put the amendments in, whatever. You have to build a new country constitution. You don't see that very often these days. And so uh, that's what the Chileans heading to the polls for, which we already know the answer. When I was prepping this story, we did not know the answer, but now we do. So this is going to be kind of a, a three-step story here. Uh, so let's get into it. Chile votes on a new constitution and a test for new leftist president Boric. Chileans are heading to the polls Sunday to vote on a proposed constitution that, if adopted, would usher in one of the most progressive constitutions in Latin America and the world. Holding a vote on a new constitution garnered widespread support two years ago, but since its drafting, that support has dwindled amid what experts say is an abundance of misinformation, frustration over the process, and uncertainty surrounding what's actually included in the proposed document. Well, it's good to know that they have that kind of clusterfuck government nonsense in other countries, not just uh, the United States of America. If the draft is adopted, Chile would become the first country in Latin America to enshrine sexual and reproductive rights into its constitution. The draft text would set up a national health care system, recognize access to drinkable water as a human right, and give indigenous tribes greater sovereignty. 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 I can't say that word. You know what I'm saying. Fighting climate change would become a constitutional duty of the state. God damn, can you imagine? The draft constitution would also lift the statute of limitations on human right violations committed during the 1973 to 1990 dictatorship of Augusto Pinochet and ensure reparations. Nearly 80% of Chileans voted in October 2020 to begin the drafting process after months of mass protests. Chile's current constitution dates back to 1980 when Pinochet was in power. It privatized health, pension, and education systems, which critics say fostered a highly unequitable society despite the country's wealth. God, where is that also happening? Huh. The draft text has been championed by leftist president Gabriel Boric, who took office this year as the youngest president in Chilean history. The latest polls, however, found 46% planned to vote to reject the new constitution, while 37% are going to approve it with 17% undecided. Chile's 15 million voters are required to take part in Sunday's referendum. Can you imagine in this country if every voting citizen was required to vote or else they would pay a fee or a penalty? I would love it. The diminishing support for the draft text might be fueled by misinformation, analysts say. Several false statements about what's included in the draft constitution have gone viral in recent months. Others say many in Chile lost faith in the convention elected to draft the Constitution. At the same time, Boric's approval ratings have plummeted as inflation has surged. Well, inflation's hitting us everywhere, people. Polls close at 6 p.m., though it's unclear when the results will be announced. Even if the draft Constitution is approved, changes are expected. Boric and his coalition have promised to make changes to and clarify some of the more controversial aspects of the proposed text. It's unclear what will happen if the draft fails, however, though Boric has said that the 2020 referendum on calling for a new constitution will stand, meaning a new drafting process could be started. Some opposition members in Congress, however, have suggested that lawmakers could just make amendments to the current constitution instead. So I see both sides on this. Uh, it's taken you about two years to get the draft ready to go. To me, that seems a little bit too long, although... I have never had to draft a new constitution for a country that was coming out of a dictatorship. I don't know how to do such things. To me, you can get it done in a couple of months. But in reality, if it takes Chile two years in America, it would take a decade. Who the fuck knows? So I'm not going to shame the president for the length of time it's taken. However, it's only common sense to me that the longer it takes, the less and less and less people are wanting it as they did initially. If Bork was elected and he had the new constitution ready to go on his first 100 days, if that's a thing in Chile, if that's a big deal like it is in America, then I would think his popularity would still be sky high. So what happened, people? The vote was on Sunday. I'm recording this on a Wednesday. So ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. Chile rejects the draft constitution in a major blow to the new leftist president, Borg. Oh, boo-hoo! 
That's too bad. Most of that shit was money. Voters in Chile rejected a progressive constitution that would have drastically changed the country. It's a major blow to leftist president Gabriel Boric and his supporters, who championed the draft text, which would have enshrined reproductive, education, housing, and indigenous rights. Can you imagine we had that in here in this country? It would have also required the country set up a national health care system and made addressing climate change a constitutional state duty. The draft text would have replaced the current constitution, which dates back to 1980 when dictator Pinochet was in power. Holding a vote on a new constitution garnered widespread support two years ago, but since its drafting, that support dwindled amid what experts say was an abundance of misinformation, frustration, things we already talked about. Official figures show that with 99.99% of the votes counted, 61.8% of voters rejected the change. So overwhelmingly a rejection. Participation was mandatory, which makes the loss even more of a gut-wrenching loss. It's unclear what's next, though. Boric has said the 2020 referendum on calling for a new constitution will stand, meaning a new drafting process could be started. So we don't know, all right? Well, just today, an article came out from the uh, local Axios journalist in Chile. What's next for Chile's constitution? The Chilean government and opposition have started talks over how to proceed after voters soundly rejected a new progressive constitution. Nearly 62% of the 12.8 million votes cast were against the proposal, which would have drastically changed the country. By the way, voting was mandatory. I like that. They keep saying it. I wish voting was mandatory in this fucking country. Just, just for a reminder, even though I've said it like three times in the last five minutes, the draft would have set up a national health care and pension systems, as well as enshrined reproductive education, housing, and indigenous rights. But the wording of how those would come about was vague. And mis misinformation was spread rampant, creating much uncertainty. Fucking misinformation, you fucking cucks. President Gabriel Boric on Monday afternoon convened the first of various meetings with all political parties to coordinate possible next steps. Boric, who championed the text, has said prior to the vote that there should be another drafting process if the proposal was rejected, which it was. Some opposition members in Congress have expressed support for restarting the process, but others say lawmakers should just make amendments to the current constitution instead. Why can't you do both at the same time and pick the best one? Writing a new constitution has been slowly gathering support since Chile's return to democracy in 1990. The current one, Augusto Pinochet dictatorship, Durga Durga Durga, the ex-president Michael or Michelle Bachelet launched a process to rewrite the constitution in 2015, but it didn't go anywhere. Two years ago, after mass protests demanding changes in a social safety net, almost 80% of Chileans voted in favor of drafting a new constitution and chose mostly non-politicians to do so. So two years ago, 80% wanted it. Two years later, only, what, 40% wanted it. So what the fuck happened? Like I said earlier, it could be that it took two years. But my hope is that now that it has been rejected, they already have the draft made so they can do a quick rewrite take the best parts of it, showcase that, take the elements that had maybe the least amount of support, work on it or outright delete it out of the text, or look at the existing constitution, take out all the awful dictatorship nonsense and add some of the more progressive elements from the rejected text. Because I think every civilized nation should enshrine reproductive rights, education, housing, and if you have indigenous uh, warfare in your past, uh, which most countries do, you should set up some kind of reparations or some kind of uh, a system in place to address those people that have since been displaced. So I'm going to keep following the story. I hope uh, Chile figures it out quick, and I hope that that young President Boric can get the new constitution draft uh, ready to roll in the next couple months before he loses even more steam. But... Uh, with that, we're going to go back to U.S. politics. Gavin Newsom, the probably near the top liberal cuck in the country, signs groundbreaking law for low-wage workers. He actually did not fuck up this time. So as much as I deride and make fun and troll Gavin Newsom, i got to give him credit on this one. California Governor Gavin Newsom on Monday signed a bill that could increase wages for fast food workers up to $22 per hour in what labor advocates are touting as a groundbreaking step for low-wage workers. 
$22 an hour should be the going minimum wage in this country. I don't give a fuck what your thoughts on that. If it don't agree with me, you're just wrong and out of touch. Like most uh, people who disagree with me are. <laughs> Newsom signed the Fast Food Accountability and Standards Recovery Act. Wow, what a bullshit name that is. Fast Food Accountability and Standards Recovery Act. Just, what can you come up with a better name, Newsom, you cuck? Or AB257. Well, that's even fucking worse. He signed this on Labor Day, despite facing fierce opposition from business groups who warned that the law could increase costs. Now, that is true. Uh, small businesses may have to increase costs. But if you're a multi-billion or even a multi-million dollar company and you raise prices because of this, you're gouging the, the customer and I hope your business fucking fails. Today's actions give hardworking fast food workers a stronger voice and seat at the table to set fair wages and critical health and safety standards across the industry. The bill will create a 10-person council made up of business, labor, and government representatives to design an industry-wide minimum wage, which could go as high as $22 per hour with an annual raise of either 3.5% or the rate of inflation. I see the wording here. It could go as high as $22 an hour. So I bet the initial one's going to come out, what, 12 bucks an hour? <laughs> no, I think in California, the minimum wage is slightly higher than 15 if I'm not mistaken. But uh, I think they're going to fuck it up. They're not, it's not going to be $22 an hour. The bill could trigger duplicate laws nationwide. The law also may signal the reemergence of sectoral bargaining, a tactic in which workers from different companies in the same industry negotiate for a pay together. Oh, what nice socialistic tendencies right there. The bill would cover as many as 550,000 fast food workers in California. Christ, that's a lot. More than half a million. Christ. The minimum wage in California is currently $15 an hour for employers with 26 or more employees and $14 an hour for employers with 25 or fewer. Oh, I see. So I was right. It is $15 an hour. It was a battle of Goliath versus David, and we just had our voice to ensure AB257 becomes a reality, said Ingrid Valerio, who works at Jack in the Box. We are united to build a better industry where all races, nationalities work together to make a better industry. We know it's not over. It's just the beginning. We're going to keep working so that these half million workers have a voice. By the way, here's what the other side is saying. You know, the commies. <laughs> By signing AB257 into law, Governor Newsom has not leveled the playing field, but instead targeted one slice of California's small businesses and consumers who rely on counter service restaurants to feed their families. That campaign to stop the law said in a statement on Monday. Well, hold on a minute. Are you saying Jack in the Box is a small business? Go fuck your mother if you believe that. My people are the backbone of my business and will always come first. Harris Liu, a Sacramento-based McDonald's franchise, said in a statement. But instead of endorsing legislation that benefits all workers, Governor Newsom is creating an unequal playing field that threatens small business owners and communities across the state. Well, go fuck yourself, Harris Liu. You work at McDonald's. You don't think McDonald's can afford to pay their workers $20 an hour? Go fuck your grandmother if you believe that. So, hey, congratulations to California, and I commend Governor Newsom. I think you're a cuck. I think you're one of the worst governors in the nation, but I applaud you on this one. Moving on to other businesses... Bed Bath & Beyond CFO falls to his death from a New York skyscraper. Oh, you have to ask yourself, when was the last time you went into a Bed Bath & Beyond on purpose? Now, I'm sure I've been drunk or high like many of you and you stumbled into a Bed Bath & Beyond on accident, wondering, I remember these stores used to be crowded and now you see tumbleweeds flying through the store. Bed Bath & Beyond confirmed. Its chief financial officer, Gustavo Arnall, died over the weekend. Police say that Arnall fell from a New York skyscraper known as the Jenga Tower on Friday. Yes, he fell from the skyscraper. The entire Bed Bath & Beyond organization is profoundly saddened by the shocking loss the company wrote in a statement. A investigation into the death is ongoing, and the New York City Medical Examiner's Office has yet to determine a cause. But this is what they're really saying here, people. Bed Bath & Beyond has struggled financially in recent years. The company ousted its CEO earlier this year 
and a few days before his untimely death, recently announced a series of steps it will take to offset declines in sales, including layoffs and store closures. Shares of Bed Bath & Beyond stock were down 25% this week and 43% this year, despite the company announcing earlier in the week it secured more than $500 million in new financing. The company was worth around $17 billion in 2013, but is now worth less than $1 billion, with roughly $100 million in cash, says the New York Times. And by the way, they did announce a series of steps, which I believe they're going to be closing 20% of their stores and laying off 20% of their staff, I believe is the steps. So do you think that had anything to do with the CFO, by the way, that's the chief financial organizer or officer, not organizer. <laughs> uh, is it any um, coincidence that the CFO of a company that just lost billions of dollars and is firing 20% of their workforce and closing, I think, 20% of their stores just said, fuck it, and jumped off a building? Or was he pushed? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a Jimmy Hoffa 2.0, but I'm saying there's some fishy business. Last story I want to talk about. And this is not that surprising, but there was a new report that was released by the CDC about uh, life expectancy. And for the first time in a long time, life expectancy in America is dropping. One of the more shocking elements from the life expectancy data released by the CDC was just how much some racial and ethnic groups saw their expected lifespan shorten. American Indians and Alaska Natives saw their life expectancy fall six and a half years in the first two years of the pandemic to just over 65 years. For perspective, that's what the life expectancy of the total U.S. population was in 1944. So, oh, Jesus. So, Alaska Natives and American Indians are dying at the same rate as they were during World War II. Now, that's positive. Life expectancy between 2019 and 2021 fell 4.2 years for Hispanic populations, 4 years for non-Hispanic black populations, 2.4 years for non-Hispanic whites, and 2.1 years for non-Hispanic Asians. I love it. It's, it's, Hispanics are always first. Why can't you just say Hispanic, black, Asian, Indian? Why do you got to have non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, non-Hispanic Asian? Are the Hispanics taking over? There is nothing weird or unusual about our population. Ann Bullock, a former director of diabetes treatment and prevention of the Federal Indian Health Services Agency and a member of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, told the New York Times, this is simply what happens biologically to populations that are chronically and profoundly stressed and deprived of resources. And I could not agree more, Ann. And I'm looking here. So this is the current U.S. life expectancy at birth by uh, demographics, I suppose. So across all races, I'm going to go into the nitty gritty here in a sec. Across all races, the life expectancy in America is slightly over 76, sitting at 76.1. So I'm 36. That means I only have 40 years left. Come on, man. But when you break it up by race... Uh, as mentioned earlier, American Indian and Alaska Natives, they have the lowest life expectancy at slightly over 65 years of age, at 65.2. Black American, slightly better, but still pretty fucking low, at 70.8. Whites are living to 76.4, slightly better than the uh, all-race average. And people that are living the best lives in this country, Hispanics, are living 77.7 .7 years. The Hispanics are living a full year longer than the whites in America. And the people that have the best life expectancy, not a surprise, at least not to me, are the Asians who have a U.S. life expectancy of 83 and a half years. Which makes sense to me because when you look at who are the oldest people in the world, they tend to be Asian, primarily from Japan. I don't know what they're doing. It could be their diet. Could be their ideologies, could be their culture, their traditions, because uh, they are massively overworked. In fact, I think Japan works more than Americans, and that's saying something. But yet they have a better way of life. Could it be they have socialized medicine and they have better social programs? I don't know, but I would wager yes. So it's a little sad that the people in this country who, like Ann Bullock said, are chronically and profoundly stressed and deprived of resources. And by the way, this is not new for Native Americans, Indigenous Americans, Blacks. 
these people have always been um, kicked and shit on and punched. And really, they're a punching bag for everybody else. And it shows you how quickly the Asians have... What do they call it when you um, become one with your country when you're new? Uh, acclimate. Yes, the Asians have truly acclimated to this country. Quick, quick, quick. Don't know why. I don't know what uh, a, a white man from the suburbs with a beard can say about such things. But uh, all I'm saying, it's not a shock to me to see the one race, Asians, having the best life expectancy. Because, uh, yeah, they just kind of ingrained themselves into our culture and society a lot easier. It could be that they don't have the history of racism, although we do have a long history of racism towards Asians, but I guess we just see them as lesser white people. And then we look at Hispanics, blacks, and indigenous people as the lowest of the low. So what can we say? What can we take from this? We should not be happy as Americans that our life expectancy is at 76. We're supposedly in the greatest country ever known. White Jesus himself built this land, and we should have a life expectancy of 100 years old, but at 76.1. All right, that's damn near what my parents are going to be. My father is 76? No, how old is my fucking father? 73 or 4, I, I don't remember. My mother 72? What year is it? Yeah, 72 and 74 or 3. So yeah, they're coming up on 76.1. So this should wake up a lot of people. We are one fat fucking entitled country. I would like to think this news would be shared a lot with people, but I highly doubt it's being shared on the mass medias around the world. But I, for one, see this, and it just uh, gives me fuel to keep going with this uh, supposedly healthy life of mine. I could always exercise more, and my eating habits could always be better, but compared to previous generations, like my parents and grandparents, I'm the fittest motherfucker that my family has ever had. <laughs> and that's sad. Uh, because there's definite improvements that I can make on a daily, weekly, and a monthly basis. So, yeah, 76 years, you know, that's not that long for a civilized first world nation, a supposed world power. I suppose it the world power, but I digress. But with that, we are done with the news. All right here. I guess we can move to close here. In closing, I want to talk about a few TV shows I started. I'll start with the most popular one. I had my doubts. Boy, did I have my doubts. But I said, fuck it. Let me watch this House of the Dragon Game of Thrones spinoff. And I got to tell you, after watching the first three episodes, I'm ready to be hurt again. <laughs> it's so good, guys. It is so motherfucking good. It is addicting. This is heroin to me. I mean, within 10 minutes... Of the first episode, I was beating off and pinching my nipples in the mirror and doing my Buffalo Bill impression. I mean, this show is fucking dank. And I'm right back into it, baby. I'm right back in that world. And I wish I didn't have to wait uh, every week for a new episode to come out. If the whole season was out, I'd watch that shit in a day. And that would probably be the second show I ever did that to. Binge the whole season in one day or two days. I don't remember the first program I did that to. I'm not much of a binger. If there's 11 episodes or 10 episodes, and even if they're only 20 minutes long, uh, it usually takes me a week, a week and a half to watch it, all of them because uh, I, I, I lose interest. Um, well, let me rephrase. I don't lose interest, but it doesn't mean as much to me if I just power through it. But if I watch it and give each episode its the respect it deserves and its analysis that it deserves then I end up liking shows a hell of a lot more. But anyway, that's just an aside there. But House of the Dragons is so fucking good. The cast is money. The acting is money. The set design, the music, the characters, the dragons, the CGI. Eh, sometimes the, the, the dragons are flying and you're like, eh, but you know what? Fuck it. You know, that's nitpicking. I'm not going to complain about that. The show is just excellent. And if you're a fan of Game of Thrones and you just can't forgive the rapening of the last two seasons, just know no one from that series is involved on this one. It just takes place in the same universe, the same world. Dave and Dan uh, have nothing to do with this one. And another good thing about this is the source material, the book that this series is based on, has already been completed. So there's no ifs, ands, or buts about the future of the series. It's already done. The big question mark, in my opinion, is that HBO has not announced how many seasons House of the Dragon will have. 
But if the source material has, and I don't know, I haven't read the books, but let's just say for a nice round number that the House of the Dragon book is 500 pages. Well, if each season has 10 or 11 episodes and each episode is an hour, how long will it take to tell the whole 500 page story? I think right off the top of my head, maybe three seasons. They're talking about, well, we don't know. It could be three. It could be five. I'm like, uh, five seasons? See, that's the problem. If you start taking something that should be, I don't know, three episodes and drag it out so that it's seven or eight, I mean, you're going to get a, a crappy series kind of like the, uh, the Hobbit movies. They were fun movies. Don't get me wrong. They were entertaining, but they were abysmal. They were just nothing compared to the actual Lord of the Ring movies. The Hobbit should have been two three-hour movies at best. At best. And that's really pushing things. They threw so much shit in there from other stories or just making it up that the Hobbit trilogy is pretty bad, in my opinion, just as a Tolkien lover. But, you know, I, I guess if I didn't like Lord of the Rings as much as I do, I would like The Hobbit more than I do. But speaking of Lord of the Rings, I also watched the first couple episodes of that series on Prime. And the first episode was eh, not bad, but not good. But it was just enough for me to be like, okay, let's see where this is going. Let me watch the second episode. It's much, much, much better. But it's still... Campy isn't the right word. Neither is cheesy. But... It just feels like a very low budget in some respect because the sets designs, the costumes, the effects, the music are not B or C level. That is A plus right there. But the acting and just, you know, the characteristics that the actors are choosing to use, uh, you know, the mannerisms and whatnot, I just, I'm not on board yet with that. And some of the acting is quite frankly pretty piss poor. But I will say it has the big P going for it promise. So I will give the Lord of the Rings series at least two more episodes just to see where the fuck this is going. They took Gladriel and kind of made her a badass, kind of like, um, what was an Angelina Jolie, Charlize Theron movie when they're like, oh, I think I'm thinking of two different movies, but yeah, they're basically John, a female John Wicks. And that's what I think they're making Gladriel, which kind of took me by surprise because I'm used to Kate Blanchett's Gladriel and the Gladriel from the Lord of the Rings books. It never really mentioned that she was a, you know, sword-wielding badass that was killing motherfuckers like it's going out of fashion. So, that kind of took me by surprise, but I'm ready to roll with it. So, yes, House of the Dragon, I'm already giving that shit an A+. I mean, it could fall off a cliff at any episode, don't get me wrong. But right now, I'm loving the show. Lord of the Rings, I'm giving it a pretty solid C. But, like I said, I'm excited to see where it goes. It has a lot of promise going for it. Now for some of the uh, lesser uh, huge programs, you know, hour-long epics. There is a show that is on the app Freevee. Never heard of it. F-R-E-E-V-E-E. If you pay for Prime, you get Freevee for free. The show is called Sprung. S-P-R-U-N-G, like you got sprung from jail. After having been previously incarcerated, Jack moves in with his former cellmate, Rooster, and is determined to turn his life around just at the start of a global pandemic. That's exactly what it is. A bunch of convicts get released from jail early, in the early stages of COVID, because, you know, it was everyone was grabbing their ass and not knowing what was going on, so they let out a bunch of nonviolent inmates. And this show is created by Greg Garcia. And you're like, who the fuck is Greg Garcia, Angelo? Well, Greg Garcia created My Name is Earl. He created, um, oh, The Guest Book is another big one. But he had another big show. Oh, Raising Hope. That was a big one. And he also did some stuff with the Family Matters back in the day. But I don't think he created that. He wrote on the show. But the guy knows quirky, weird comedy. I don't know how some of you people feel about the TV series My Name is Earl and Raising Hope. They are fun series to me. They are fun. It doesn't seem like it's a PG. It's kind of borderline PG-13 R rating humor but done in kind of a family, quirky, weird style that's still family-friendly. Uh, I really enjoy almost every episode of My Name and Earl and Raising Hope that I've seen. And so I was excited to give Sprung a chance because I'm a fan of this Greg Garcia, and he put in the show to star Garrett Dillahunt, which I've talked about on previous podcasts. I'm a giant fan of his. I think he's a 
massively underrated actor. The guy can do uh, action, he can do comedy, he can do drama, he can do westerns. The guy really can do it all. You look him up on IMDb, you see that right away he was in 12 Years a Slave, Deadwood, No Country for Old Men, Raising Hope, of course. He's in the Where the Crawdads Sing. I think that was the podcast I was talking about where uh, he plays the father. Well, he, he does not. he's not in all the good things. He is in that Fear the Walking Dead spinoff, uh, all 40-something episodes. But uh, look him up. Uh, you may recognize him from some of your favorite shows. I recognized him uh, early on as being a damn good actor when I saw him play dual roles in Deadwood. And I'm fairly certain, wasn't he in another series? Oh, Justified, that's right. He was excellent in Justified. And just Gar- Garrett Dillahunt, man, just an underrated, excellent actor. He's good in everything I see him in. Even in shit movies or shit series, he is still good. And uh, maybe it's because he studied journalism at the University of Washington, so he has some connection to the Pacific Northwest, where I'm from. But the guy's just money. And plus, he went to get a journalism degree, like me. And I should have went into acting, too. I could have been starring with Garrett Dillahunt. Uh, anyway, damn good actor. And Sprung itself is a pretty funny series. If you like uh, comedy series like My Name is Earl and Raising Hope, then you'll like Sprung. In my opinion, so far, there's been six episodes, I believe. It's not as good as Raising Hope and My Name is Earl, but it's still pretty damn good. I give it uh, a solid B. Not a B plus, but not a B minus. But I'm excited to see where the series goes. Uh, Another comedy series I started streaming on Hulu. It's called This Fool. It's about uh, Julio Lopez. He's a punk-ass bitch with a heart of gold who goes out of his way to help everyone but himself. And that doesn't really do the show justice. Uh, Julio Lopez, the main character, works for a nonprofit rehabilitation center for ex-cons coming out and trying to help them get back into society, either getting jobs, getting training, um, keeping them away from the gang life. It's predominantly Latin humor. Uh, uh, actually, what is it called? Uh, California Mexican, whatever you want to call that. Uh, humor. And uh, I have some of those people in my life that grew up you know, in Sacramento and um, Los Angeles, uh, Orange County in the 90s and whatnot. And the ones not from Orange County tell me some fucking horror stories about being in gangs and living in the streets back in the day. And uh, this show is a comedy. It is kind of a dark comedy, but it is a comedy. I had never seen any of the actors before, but they are all damn good in all of their respective characters. Well, I take that back. The, 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 the star that I knew was Michael Imperioli, you know, uh, Christopher Moltisanti from The Sopranos. He plays Minister Payne, who, who runs the nonprofit. Uh, and they got some famous guest stars coming in um, every couple episodes. But the, if you like um, a different kind of humor, I, I kind of compare this to Reservation Dogs, another damn good show. Uh, from FX that I watch on Hulu. Reservation Dogs is about indigenous kids growing up in Oklahoma and just the awfulness that is the reservations. But again, it has some lighthearted humor, some dark humor, there's some drama, much like This Fool. So uh, check out Reservation Dogs while you're at it and This Fool. And I can't really give my opinion about it quite yet because I literally just watched the first two episodes. But everybody, and I'm talking everybody, has been telling me to watch The Bear, another FX show that's streaming on Hulu. And I watched the first two episodes, and I am liking it. But I need to watch more before I give an honest uh, opinion. But my latest nostalgia hit series that I'm re-watching, I did this with The Simpsons, I did it with Married with Children, and now I'm starting King of the Hill. King of the Hill was a show that I would watch almost every week when it was probably the first five or six years of its uh, inception. Uh, by the way, the first season was 1997, and I can just guesstimate that I probably watched it almost through high school, and I graduated in 04, so I, I'm going to say I stopped watching it around 04, 03, maybe even 05, I don't know. Uh, so far, I'm on the third season, and this show, you know, it was such an important show to me growing up got, um, at, at that stage of my life. But I did not like any of the female characters when I was young. I idolized Hank Hill. I thought Bobby was hilarious. I hated Peggy. I thought Luann was just a dumb slut. I just, you know, I was very a sexist white kid, you know, uh, back in the day. But now I'm watching it as a 36-year-old. Christ. You know, whenever I say my age, 36, it still doesn't seem accurate. I feel like I'm Cuban and playing in the baseball league. I'm lying. (laughs) Well, then I would be much older because that's what the Cubans do. But anyway, back to King of the Hill. 
So I'm rewatching episodes that I remember vividly from when I was young and really hating Luann or hating Peggy. But now as a, you know, an adult, a man, I find myself thinking, oh, I understand why I didn't like these female characters. It's because I didn't know the depth. I didn't know some of the privileges that men have that women don't have. How could I at that stage of my life? And so now certain episodes that I just grew to loathe Peggy, I'm now seeing things her point of view. And I'm thinking, Jesus, this show is really spectacular. I got to give Mike Judge even more credit than I already do. By the way, Mike Judge has not just done King of the Hill. The guy did Beavis and Butthead. Um, what the fuck is that other movie that became a cult hit uh, with Luke Wilson? God damn it. Yeah, he also did Office Space too. Uh, Idiocracy, that's right. Oh, that's right. He did uh, Silicon Valley too. But the, anyway, the guy's fucking awesome. Uh, but yeah, King of the Hill is even better than I remember in different ways, too. There, there's just a depth to it that I never caught before. You know, if it's like an onion, when I was young, I maybe only caught the first or second layer of a joke or a plot or a story or a character development. Now that I'm a little wiser, I see so much more. And the show is really shooting up my all-time favorites charts now because I'm halfway through the third season, I believe, and I'm already enjoying it way more than I thought I would. I thought it would be a little bit of a, of a, of a chore, the, the initial couple episodes, but nope, right away, I was sucked back into a time machine and spit out back into the uh, late 90s and early 2000s. So I recommend it if you're going to watch a, a TV series for that nostalgia hit uh, that I like to do. I don't know what my next nostalgia series will be. I have to give that some thought. But King of the Hill has 258 episodes. And much like other uh, acclaimed, critically acclaimed shows at Fox, Fox fucked them over and never let them uh, write a series finale. They just canceled it out of the blue. So fuck you, Fox. I hope uh, Fox News crashes on your ass and you get thrown out into a black hole. Uh, but with that, we are done. I love y'all. Take it sleazy. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Treat others as you want to be treated. And don't be a judgmental cunt, okay? Football season starting tomorrow. You got the Bills against the reigning Super Bowl champs, the Rams. Uh, Monday Night Football is going to be Seattle versus Denver with Russell Wilson on his first game as a Bronco. Coming back to Seattle and playing us at home. I hope we don't boo him too much. We're going to boo him, but I think we're going to have... Um, well, I take that back. We are going to have some booing, but we're going to have uh, predominant uh, cheers, I believe. We're going to really be applauding and cheering him and thanking him for everything he did for this city. But let's not forget, he did one out, and I think we wanted him out too. So I'm happy that we uh, got what we can for him before he um, crashed and burned, which I think is not that far away. Denver's going to rue the day they signed Russell Wilson to that big-ass extension. Motherfucker will be getting damn near $60 million, and I think the third year the uh, agreement. So fucking a while, but on that note, peace out, bitches.